if a member listens to you, you are the main body. But you're not listening to you. Take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence or two or three witnesses. If your member refuses to listen to them, tell the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such one be you as a Gentile or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you buy on earth will be bound in heaven. But whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. This is God's good word for us, God's Lord and people. So, many years ago, there was, excuse me, a comic strip called Calvin and Hobbes. And uh, Calvin uh, and Hobbes is about a boy um, and his stuffed tiger, tiger, who then becomes a real tiger, but not like a mean tiger, like a fun, playful tiger. And they have all sorts of adventures together, and it's this kind of, you know, wistful reflection on childhood, and a little silly. And one of the things that was a recurring theme in the Calvin and Hobbes comic is the game of Calvin Fall. This was a game that, uh, you know, Calvin and Hobbes had made up, and the only rule of Calvin Fall is that you can never use the same rules twice. Except for the one rule that says you're never going to use the same rules one. So it is this entirely made up game that is different every time. So it might be playing with badminton bats, it might be playing with a volleyball, it might be more like tag, there might be rules, there might be singing, it doesn't matter. There's a thousand different ways to play the game of volleyball. With them, the only consistent rule being you cannot use the same rules. Twice. Now, it is sure, sure, it's a reflection on childhood, on the silliness of childhood games, but it is also an examination of how so much of life is just rules that we have made up that don't necessarily matter. The score of Calvin Ball was always absolutely ludicrous. One score could be Q to 12. Who's made? I don't know. It's entirely made up. And a lot of particularly, I mean, maybe not a lot of adult life and young adult life can feel like Calvin Ball. And actually, so much of life is itself Calvin Just Something we have arbitrarily made up by arbitrary rules. Calvin Ball is not the only sport that is Calvin Ball. All sports are Calvin Ball. They just happen to be a version of Calvin Ball that we keep playing over and over again as they continue to uh, tweak the formula of Major League Baseball. This is becoming even more fluid than Major League Baseball. And I love baseball. I love my Astros. But you know, it's made up, right? Sports is fundamentally a game that we have made up. We enjoy watching it, but it's not itself real. They are just arbitrary rules and arbitrary scores. So many civic organizations with elaborate rules can feel a lot like Calvin Ball. A lot of why are we seeing a great resignation among you know office workers is because a lot of office work ends up just feeling like Calvin Ball. We're just with much meaner referees. You go in, you do something, it changes all the time, you get something, what are we doing? I don't know. Feels largely made up. Feels like home. I go to thrift stores very frequently. It's actually where a lot of the technology around this church comes from because you can get some amazing deals. But most thrift stores don't impress me. The kind of thrift store that does impress me is the Goodwill Outlet. If you're not familiar with the Goodwill Outlet, is, this is where all the stuff they don't think they can sell in their stores goes. And you don't buy it by the item, you buy it by the pound. And they come out on these giant, like, you know, four by six carts. They're just wheeled out. And then a whole bunch of people descend on the carts. They're wearing gloves, because God knows. Where literally God only knows where that stuff has come from. And they pick through people's lives and buy it by the pound. And so it might be clothing, or shoes, or sports equipment, or Bible studies, or grandmother's wedding dress. You have no idea, right? And even after the pickers descend upon them, they weep. 
wheel that part away of the few items left, and what you are seeing is the wreckage of people's lives. And even the buying of stuff starts to feel like Calvin Ball. Calvin Ball becomes a pleasant way to talk about a kind of wistful nihilism that so much of what goes into everyday modern life feels made up. So it becomes difficult to see what is real. Specifically, church can start to feel like another one of those Calvin Ball activities that we just made up arbitrarily and then we just kept doing for 2,000 years. But it's just another one of those made up things that doesn't matter, right? Like sports, like buying stuff, like the line club. It just becomes that some of these things are good, some of these things are bad. It doesn't matter, we're all made up. But this one isn't. Church is one of the few things in this world that is fundamentally real. Because it is God with God's people, binding God's people together, working with God's people for real cosmic implications. That's the bedrock logic of this passage from Matthew 18. Most of this passage in Matthew 18 is about how to deal with church conflict. If you want to know my thoughts on that, read the Corporate Study or listen to the podcast, because I, I think we do need to talk about church conflict, but I actually want to go to a much deeper level about this scripture than just on the surface what the first kind of three or four verses talk about, and look at what, what it's tapped onto the end of it which reveals something far deeper. The last few verses of this get this kind of this deeper logic about what on earth are we doing here together. Picking up in verse 18. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, two or three of you agree, excuse me, two of you agree on earth about anything you ask that will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For two or three are gathered in my name, I am among you. <laughs> There's more than a couple of people here in this room. That means God is among us. And what collectively we find on earth is bound in heaven. And what we collectively agree on together becomes a part of the work of God in the world. This is the stakes of church life. Matthew talks more about the church than any other gospel writer. We think, for a lot of reasons, partly because he includes material like this, that Matthew is leading a church community. So Matthew much more than the other three gospel writers are looking specifically at what does a church need to hear and how explicitly does a church community need to hear. This is where you get the most succinct message of what on earth are we supposed to be doing? It's in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Right? This is much clearer. Luke gets there. John gets there in his own way, Mark Matthew makes sure we get explicitly, Jesus tells us, this is what we're supposed to do. And this is where Matthew delves into how do we do this thing called church. Well, it turns out you work together. Is there a conflict in your midst? There may well be. It's a bunch of different people all trying to do something together. They're writing conflict. Here's how you do conflict. You do conflict together. Why do you do conflict together? Because the stakes of what we are doing is on a cosmic scale. <laughs> that maybe the rules of denominations, which Matthew would have no idea about, might feel like Calvin. But the work of a church together, that is one of the most real things out there. 
Because God is present with us. God is working alongside us. And God is working alongside us together. This is a high ball. This is something miraculous. This is something that often we lose sight of in church life because we get caught up in the doing of it and stop thinking about the thing that we are actually doing. Or we keep saying, well, this is how church works and stop thinking about what is the work of church. The work of church is a group of people brought together by God to share God's love and grace with each other, to be bound together to help one another get through the nightmare that is life, and to help grow the number of people who have access to that love, comfort, grace, and support. When I was a, a, a pastor in the States, which was a whole period of my life. One of the things that I would hear often from men of a certain age who were not in church was, well, I can worship God here on my tractor, um, as well as I can worship God in church. Now, I don't want to take away from seeing God in the glories of nature. I do see God in the glories of nature. I'm driving uh, my son uh, to a choir rehearsal um, yesterday morning, so I was up a little earlier, certainly out a little earlier than I might be on a Saturday morning normally, and that's my kind of real day off to go to sleep and catch up. And so I'm on uh, 610, driving uh, into a gallery area, and the light hit the smog just right. This is just a beautiful time to have a sunny day in Houston. The clouds are bright, and the sun is passing through the humidity and the smog. I can see, I this is like joking, but it's true. I can see a little bit of God's creation in the vastness of the vista, like all it, until like one bank snap and then they blow this as we blown up 59 and 610, and my whole life just gets back into the same nightmare for this season. I love God. I love seeing God in nature. And yes, I too, I was not driving a tractor, this is important. I too have rode a tractor and experienced the joy of the war. But it said it's not even a church because you can worship God on a tractor. It's to miss the thing that we're actually doing. You can be a person who has accepted Christ into your life, and then ride a, tra ride a tractor and be reconfirmed in it. Yes. But salvation is meant to be the first step, not the last step. Salvation is merely the beginning. Salvation is merely the door. The rest of it then begins, because the goal of church, in a real cosmic way, is to get all of us from one age to the next. To get all of us together from one age, an age of suffering, an age of pain, an age of sickness, an age of difficulty, to that point where we feast at Christ's heavenly banquet, hear the cloud of angels, and all live in peace forever. But there's a long stretch between one and the other, and I don't know if you've noticed, but I've noticed this life is incredibly difficult. How is God providing for us in this incredibly difficult life? I'm sitting on my tractor all alone. I have no idea. Look to your left. Look to your right. Look forward. Look back. How is God getting you from this age of pain and suffering to the age of peace and joy? It's what you find on earth, what you find in heaven. When two of you agree on something, it happens. For wherever two or more of you are gathered in my name, there I will be. Church. Not the building. Not the institution with a reasonable check. The 1,000 page book. That's just our denomination. It's like a 1,000 page book. 
It's on hair and paper. So it's gotten very cheap. It's gotten smaller over time. Um, it got bigger for a while. In 1893, rule book, we call it book of discipline. That doesn't matter. Uh, I have an 1893 book of discipline. I have a 1996 book of discipline. And these are declining in size, although they increase in length. It's fascinating. The paper is not thinner, so it got cheaper. It's not the thing in the thousand cases. That really helps, hopefully, this will take the thing The actual thing that we are doing is being the face of God for one another and for the world. Biblical authors choose their words on purpose. Paul uses the language of the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. The thing here that is translated as a church member, if a church member sins against you, it's not, it's not like I don't know what member of, I know churches. It's not, it's not member of, it's not three words, member of Ecclesia, it's the help of just part of the right? It's actually, if a brother or sister sins against you, because we're not just like members of an organization, right? Where you like, you know, I, you know, I used to be a member of Costco, right? But like, Costco is not going to be fair for me when my grandmother died, right? Like, you know, someone might buy the card for me at Costco. So like, you can be a member. So I had an Xbox card for a while. I was a member, right? This is not a member. We are not members. We are brothers and sisters. We are far closer than or members of life rules and structures. That's not what's happening here. What's happening is you have an extended family to help you through the vicissitudes of this that all may get to the other side. We hear so often in church. I bring it up as often as I can because it seems to be one of the points of the New Testament author's function. It's the whole poem. It's what Revelation is about. Revelation is fundamentally a book, not about beings with weird eyes. It's a book about holding on. From kind of Hebrews on, all those little letters are often come later, are often about holding on. Because even 2,000 years ago, the first generation of Christians, your Peter, James, and John's, right, realized that this was going to be difficult. That we're going to settle in the long haul. The world is not always going to treat us well. Life is hard to begin with. Now we on a mission from God, it only gets more challenging. And so they want us to remember how to hold on. But we were not left alone to hold on by ourselves. We were given the Holy Spirit, and more specifically, we were given each other. That is church. That is why this matters. Not because I have to report to some abstract denomination what my numbers are. The friend of mine first like, stopped doing that, and I'm really proud of him. Because that's not what we're doing. What we're doing is loving, supporting, and caring for one another and for the community around us so that as many people as possible make it to the heavenly man. That's church. And so we should hear, I want us to hear the comfort from that. Oh my God, I'm not alone. I have people I can rely on. God knows this is hard. God knows this is hard. God knows this is hard. God has given you a family to help you with that. But also I have a challenge. As Matthew wants you to hear the challenge, right? Like, don't just shred the church because of conflict. Work through, have the whatever to work through your conflict. Because what we're doing here matters cosmically. Here's the challenge. May we not be a church by a legal designation. We are legally speaking, house of worship. That's the nature of what we're trying to do. It's spend more time in our legal documents than I ever really imagined I wanted to do. May we be the church. Community of people. Bound together by God. This key link to the chain of providing for one another and providing for a broken world that we can all get the life and to come. Let us pray. Grace
showing up. We give you thanks. Give you thanks that we have a family. That no matter what our familial status is, single, married, ton of kids, no kids, empty nest, nest that feels love fuller than their daughter, that we have a family beyond biology. Family. The Holy Spirit. Family that is real. One of the realest things in the cosmos. God, may we value this thing called church. May we actually do this thing called church. Be bound together by your spirit and see the depth, know the influence, live it so we can get through it. We can get through it. Jesus will fly in your heart. Amen.